Hello, I'm Jenny Thomas, Director of Communication and Insight at IWFM. Welcome wherever you're joining us from on what I hope for you is a sunny Tuesday to our All Levels Masterclass, setting you on your digital maturity journey in partnership with Plan On. Many of you will know that also with Plan On, IWFM has recently released new guidance note, building a digital maturity pathway for smarter organisations. And I guess the starting point for that work is that today, with increasingly competitive conditions, digital innovation is no longer just nice to have. Quite the opposite, in fact. It is a vital element of organisational success. That's why it's important for professionals to get to grips with recent developments. So the guidance, which was the subject of our Navigating Turbulent Times webinar last week, was about building a pathway to digital maturity. And in today's masterclass, we're hoping to set you and your organisations on your way to digital maturity. So basically, we're here to help you, workplace and facilities professionals, at every level to realise the benefits of digital innovation. Now, I think we will hear firsthand today that the benefits of this are real, increased productivity, lower costs, supporting ESG, sustainability outcomes, while also helping organisations to get over challenges like fragmented data and sourcing technical savvy staff. Um, I'm joined by a really brilliant panel who will introduce themselves shortly, and between us, we'll end to provide you, I think, with four things this afternoon, um, really granular insight on the technical aspects of building digital maturity, um, help to understand why digital innovation matters for processes, and that's from data-driven strategy all the way to generative AI, um, experience from organisations that have benefited from digital maturity, and best practice on digital innovation and how you can apply it in different organisational settings. Um, what we're aiming for in today's session, for which we've got 90 minutes, is to be interactive and accessible. So in addition to our wonderful panel, comprising our technical expert, Gordon, author of the guidance, we'll present two case studies in two quite different organisations that are on their digital journey. One from Dan, a practitioner, somebody who's put this stuff into practice to deliver strategic outcomes and a case study introduced by Alex, our partner in this work. Fundamentally, though, this session is for you. So one thing we'll want to do today is to hear from you to answer your questions, whether you are a digital novice or a digital expert, to steer the session to focus on the areas you'd like to address and hopefully to address your issues and concerns around this. And we'll do that in a number of ways. We'll run some polls to set the scene as we go through. We'll open the Q&A as we usually do in our webinar sessions and We'll make time for questions at the as we go through and at the end. And we'll also open up the chat function this time so we can get an interactive conversation going between you, our audience, and our panel. And I hope that our talented technical team and me uh, will be able to keep that fluent as we go through. So we'll be doing some, some juggling in the background here with, the, with hopefully all of the wonderful questions and comments that are going to come through from you. Now, we have an excellent lineup for today's masterclass. Um, I'll get them to introduce themselves in a second. Um, after they've introduced themselves and before we get into the substance of today, we, we'd really like to get a sense of who we've got in our virtual room, where you are on your digital journeys, whether you're standing at threshold or whether you're well on your way. And um, we'll do that with some quick polling to help us to do that. Firstly, to the panel. Welcome again to you all. Gordon, could I turn to you, then perhaps to Dan, and then finally, Alex, to introduce yourselves to our audience today. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Gordon Mitchell, looking forward to today's session. I'm the co-founder of an organisation called Holis, which is an AI platform dealing particularly with operational best practice and um, ethics. I'm also, uh, as as it says on the screen, the chair of the IWFM special um, techni special interest group for technology. And I also offered the digital maturity pathway for smarter organisations uh, that Jenny just referenced. I'm also a convener with ISO for digital data and technology across our 54 country membership. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, like Gordon, excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Dan Stephen. I'm the Senior Facilities Manager for Adidas. Um, also a member of the Tech SIG group that Gordon heads up. Um, been with Adidas almost four years. 
Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Anne. Um, Alex Rogers, head of sales here at Plan in the UK. Um, just looking back at that picture, my beard is slightly longer, although Christmas is coming up. But uh, yeah, really looking forward to this session and um, sharing some insights onto one of our customers. Uh, nice to meet you all. Well, thank you very much, all three of you, and welcome again. Now, before I pass to Gordon to take us through what I think is the core of today's masterclass, I'd like to begin with three short questions that will help us to understand a bit more about you, our audience, and make sure that we can, as we go through, tailor the content to the things that matter to you. Um, Kaya, you have kindly popped up the polls that we'd like you to answer. Um, you can, everybody, expand the window yourselves if that's a little bit narrow on the screen we've got there for you. So feel free to do that on your own settings if you if you if you'd find that helpful um and if you could just give us your answers to these questions so essentially how involved have you been on digital transformation within your organization who have you, who have you been on that journey if you've been on it at all um what's in the way what's stopping you from playing more of a role in digital transformation and maturity in your organization. And you can answer more than one of those um, points if, if more than one of those conditions applies to you in your situation today. Um, and then the third question, really important is to understand the strategic setup of this. What is driving you? What are the main reasons or motivations for your digital transformation activity? Um, so who are you in this journey? If anything's stopping you or getting in the way of you getting on this journey, what is it? And um, what's driving you? What's driving you on to um, get onto this journey or what's driving your organisation to get you into this? I'll just give you a couple of minutes to um, answer that question. Um, whilst reminding you that we'd really like your questions to come through on the chat as we go through. Um, have we got answers, Kaya, to those questions? Do we need to give people a little bit more time to do it? Whoa, so just taking question one first, we've got a real mix here, haven't we? The majority, um, well, about a third each are leading or what we call ordinary stakeholders in this. So leading it or, or playing a really meaty role in this. And then about 15% aside are minor stakeholders, 18% of you, so that's nearly one in five, have got little to no involvement um, in this. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? So, but most of you are leading it or playing a decent role in it. Um, what's stopping you? Wow, that's a really even split, isn't it? So what's stopping you? So about a third of you lack the skills or the knowledge. Um, four in 10 of you haven't got the time or the capacity. So there's capacity and time issue there. Um, one in five, 22%, there's a lack of FM responsibility in this space. So that's something I think there's an opportunity to address here, perhaps in some of the content we've got today. Um, a third have got more pressing priorities than this. 22%, um, the responsibility is elsewhere. So perhaps that that's a corollary of the lack of F FM responsibility. 22% FM is not responsible. 22% responsibility somewhere else in the organisation. And then a third have got limits on budget. So there's a whole range of reasons and a whole range of barriers there, which are, I think, broadly equally split with lack of time or capacity, the leader in that. Um, and then again, your main motivations, again, really, really interesting here. So I guess probably what you'd expect um, some of the this audience to be saying really 76%, so three quarters are, are, are hoping that um, digital transformation will improve your productivity. 72% um, are wanting it to improve user experience. Serious factor for workplace and facilities professionals. 72% are hoping to make savings to reduce costs, efficiencies, and 40% risk reduction 
building safety and um, 60 percent of you, six in 10, are hoping to become more sustainable. So I, I just think from that we've got I mean, Gordon, you've got some amazing stats I know coming up in your presentation. And I think um, we've got a really good range of reasons people want to do it, reasons people are prevented from doing it and hopes that people have got to do it. And I suppose there's no better time um, really um, for us to um, hand over to you, Gordon, while we're inviting our audience to keep the questions coming through. Gordon, over to you. Thanks again, Jenny. So hopefully some of you have had the chance to review our uh, guidance document. The, the maturity framework's about an ability to sort of map where you are, where you'd like to get to and have that almost democratised understanding of your uh, transformational journey. But today we're very much going to look at that journey. So where does that framework meet reality to an extent? Um, so there's part, part of the the framework that we will will highlight in terms of addressing this subject, but just looking to sort of break it down into a little more bite-sized pieces and put some of the experience and context around some of those aspects. And as Jenny said, uh, welcome the questions as we as we go through, and we'll all try and weigh in on that. So if we hit the first slide, we're looking at generally just transformation digital um, in, in FM. I think, as, as Jenny mentioned earlier on, it's not not really optional anymore. Um, it's just what do you do and in what way do you do it to, I guess, maximise your own return? And, the, and it's not going to typically be big bang territory either. It's going to be a quite iterative process that you have to take first steps and, you know, lead on a, into a continuous improvement um, way, of, way of existing with digital. So here, here we're really kind of looking at, much as you would in, in traditional project management style, is just creating these... Um, areas for, I guess, success. Um, what we're ultimately talking about, whether the digital is involved or not, is a change management program. It just, the way digital affects that change is, is kind of multifaceted um, in, in the adaptation, which plays into people's digital skills and, you know, the whole the whole way that you sort of think and appreciate your operating model. So here we're really looking at, to, to a certain extent, it might see digital transformation, but it's almost to an extent a reimagining of the FM value proposition. So I guess that's where <clears throat> just breaking this down into the sections that we're going to walk through helps you take back control and it doesn't need to be something that and I was quite encouraged to, to be honest with the statistics that um, a lot of a lot of you are leading this charge uh, but it's certainly I think a charge that we as a sector are well placed to lead and particularly when you start looking at some of the broader value based outcomes that this type of transformation can bring to an organisation it puts us in a very strong position to to tackle things like ESG and, and really bring bring that additional value to the C suite. So as we as we move into just looking at the, the main core six sections that we're going to tackle today on the next slide, um where as as you start applying this type of framework to design this um, environment for success that the obviously the further we go to the right hand side the more blended 
all of these elements become. So although we've got them in separate boxes today, uh, the, the, the remaining slides will hopefully start to bring some of this together and allow it to be modelled against your, your own operational function uh, sets and and ultimately how how data how data driven you you can evolve to be um it's a it's a big challenge at the moment i would say is you want to be data driven not driven by data and a lot of the failure we have in the sector is we end up having technologies that are sometimes kind of almost going against the green um so it, it's it's so important in my in my mind to be uh a, a fm leading this transformation uh, and not being almost a victim of it so sometimes there's a i guess a digital divide there's even a language set and terminologies that if if you're history hasn't taken you into some of those technological spaces then it's it's almost a very alien thing so it, it, it fast becomes a conversation that you can't keep up with so this is really about sort of bringing it home and coming up with a common language that that everyone can can work with and fm can you know really start to see its digital value so I'm not. I'm not going to go through each of these. You, you, everyone can see what's on the screen, and certainly the the guidance uh, does unpack this a little more. Uh, we're going to spend most of today, uh, the time today, really digging into how this aligns to that transformational um, progress and programs, maybe. But um, what you can see here is these clearly defined areas that the guidance does um, tackle, and as I say. Um, in the maturity framework th there's a lot more context to what's going on in that document but this certainly ties into that section that we've considered in, in the now published document so if we get into the actual journey set we're going to start to break this down into clearly we're going to start at the left uh, and as we go we'll have a very much a blended um, phase as we start to unpack this that starts to bring all six of these areas into um, full operational alignment and fruition. So, if we... Gordon, sorry, Gordon, is it worth at this stage just taking a quick pulse track of our audience and seeing where where we think they are on these um, on on you know if you think about these stages, just really where they're you know wh where they've typically been involved um in 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 those um stages i wondered kaya whether we had two quick questions just to ask at this stage so just we just thought we'd like to sort of see where you are going typically gordon's kind of shared the six stages but um has the development of your digital plans typically involved the following stages you can answer all or none or some of those. Um, and then of those six stages, are there any that you regard as particularly challenging or problematic um, within your organisation? So again, the same six options there. And then there's an option to say, actually, none of these if you are not embarked yet on this journey or if you are um, not encountering any of those issues it would be really useful to try to understand where you are in this as Gordon um, takes us um, through um, the next stages of the set. Um, I think Kaya we probably just need to give people a couple of seconds to vote on that and then we'll just have a look at how that's come out um for where people think they might be um in developing their plans whether it's visioning stakeholder engagement understanding what's already there considering a range of options getting a roadmap together 
or really understanding people's roles and responsibilities to take this forward in the organisation, or none of them. Okay, so we've got, Gordon, I think a really clear mix here. We've only got 16% um, of recipients saying that they're not doing, haven't involved any of those stages in their work. I think that's that's very encouraging. Um, and um, understanding what already exists and considering a range of options are up there with the lead, lead activities that people are taking. Um, half of people are visioning and um, more than half of people are also taking the other steps. So I, I, I think that's very encouraging. And then looking at the, the blockers or the barriers or the challenges involving stakeholders as well out in Leeds. Two thirds of people said that that was a challenge involving everybody. Um, only 4% of people had no challenges. So that's perhaps something we can touch on. Um, and then um, I think the next biggest challenge is we're establishing clarity around roles and responsibilities. And I think that came out in the first poll as well, didn't it? You know, is FM involved? It's not, it's other people. I thought that was quite interesting. And starting with a clear vision was also a, a, a challenge for what are we trying to do here? So I think um, perhaps Gordon, maybe just a little bit of a focus on involving other people and clarity on roles and responsibilities would be really interesting there as we go through. Thank you. Back to you. Thanks, Judy. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I guess in a way that that didn't surprise me too much. There's I think part of what the, the challenge um that we, we all face is there isn't a normal. There isn't a a thing that we can all sort of point at. There's some great examples starting to emerge, but this journey we've collectively been on isn't certainly near the end. I mean we've all seen over the past decade various technologies being established and um, really changing the way we can think about ourselves and that's not slowing down but in a lot of ways you know even something like BIM FM isn't really uh, working with properly certainly not at scale there's pockets of it but uh, you know BIM's been around for an awful long time now um, I mean, even as a international standard, it's on its fifth year review um, today. Um, so it's a it's a changing landscape, and I think that's part of what this whole process is about: is is how do you eat that how do you eat that elephant? How do you tackle the big conversations in the large landscape and break it into bite sized pieces that you can manage and work with? But if we if we go to the next slide we'll, we'll start to tackle hopefully some of that um so really we've seen the the point about well both creating that clear vision but also about the stakeholders and to my mind even the actual culture of the organization is really critical to any transformation that we look to undertake so if we look at something like information um, management. I, I mentioned BIM earlier on, and if we look at the kind of methodologies that have been created to make sure we are all on the same page and, and how to kind of flush that out, then we have um, certainly defined in ISO 19650, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, um, something called OIRs, organization information requirements and not every FM operation or practice or organization has these but from an information point of view these are very very important and clearly digital change is um, built on top of an undercurrent of information so these OIRs are really in in the ISO 19650 framework the, the the starting point of the information model um, for, and for very good reason uh, because all your other IRs information requirements are have to have nested in them these organization requirements or else it's 
very difficult to live with these requirements when you have to react to them. Typically then lots of sp spreadsheets and reports come together to tell those stories rather than it being, you know, native within the information model. And the second you have to start handling the data, then that becomes a resource um, challenge. And that's where sometimes, and unfortunately, even in the UK, more often than not, we end up not getting a return of investment of digital change programs. Uh, typically not because the technology isn't capable, but the actual organization isn't ready to work with that data in a more um, transformed capacity. So to me, this one's really, really critical, just like in our own buildings without the right foundations the whole thing can fall down um, so here you know something like um, ISO 19650 already gives us clear guidance it's uh, quite mature in the UK generally speaking in terms of um, some of the, the the national and national initiatives and programs um, have have tackled this subject matter bodies like NEMA um, used to be the UK BIM Alliance. Um, they've they've done a lot of work in the government inter industry interoperability group as well. Um, part of part of NEMA now, but there's lots of work there. And more recently, the Building Safety Alliance has done some good work around the golden thread um, and and starting to get into these more seismic shift spaces. But certainly, I think this is not only a good start point to make sure that your digital change programs are actually going to deliver on what you expect of them, but if you get the the OIRs are an, are an organizational wide um, information requirement as it as it states. But I think if you can start to, and in some organisations, possibly instigate the creation of such a thing, then it affords FM a real opportunity to at least be involved in that conversation from the stats we've seen earlier on, but you know, quite quite possibly become one of the main components in that ongoing initiative, organisation wide. So this is our. This is kind of, as we've talked through the session so far, just really getting to that point of we can start. We've got a good place. We know what we're doing. We know where we're coming from, where we're trying to go. And we've not done any of the hard work yet. But certainly, I think if you can't tell that story in the organization's language, both in terms of the why and the how, then you're already one hand tied behind your back, and as I say, I would I would certainly um, recommend some of the work that's been already produced. ISO nineteen six fifty, British Standard eight five three six as well is another strong one, also part of the the BIM framework. Um, so a lot of this resource is is out there. Some of the work that even came out of the Centre for Digital Built Britain was was really 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 useful and it's all in the public domain so I think I don't know if there's it's worth just a touch base with, with where we're at now Jenny if, before we move to the next um, slide I think there's maybe some questions popped up so there are some questions popped up one actually I was going to wait for you to get to stakeholders because there's a really brilliant one on stakeholders that Remco's asked going if you, if you um, yeah I think Pause so I, I, yeah I think it would be useful to get to that then and then there's another really good one that Reed's asked but I want to come around to that a little bit later because it's a big base question that he's asked if that's okay sure Thanks everyone for 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 weighing in. It's uh it's gonna make it's gonna make um this session hopefully uh, more valuable to you if we can really understand where this uh, applies to you uh, and make it a little more personal. We can pop to the next slide then. We, as Jenny uh, mentioned, it's then about stakeholders. There's 
part of the, the, the opportunity, but also the challenge of FM is we're such a broad church. We, in some organizations, can do such a enormous amount of services that, <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure for, for each and every one of you, with, if, with your kind of uninitiated non-FM friends, sometimes trying to explain what FM is, if they're not familiar with it, is is a is a task. Uh, we can have you know very much maintenance orientated, sometimes customer experience orientated, sometimes sustainability energy management. I mean it's it, it's all big ticket items. So again if you've got good OIRs, then understanding how that maps to your the, the organization's stakeholder community becomes obviously something that can be done. And if that if both of those things are done, then any change program you have, you'll be able to draw from that mapping and know exactly who and in what capacity those stakeholders are, um, which is why the, the previous stage is so important. But sometimes those OIRs don't exist and maybe the first project you're going to undertake is, you know, to start building out some of these these things. So you can't you can't wait, but you have to involve those those stakeholder groups. So again, you can I guess start to build this as as you go um, and start to build these things out so that at least when you come to the next um, instance you already have laid some of the the pathway for, for those iterations. But Again, just just thinking about your FM operation, you know who you interact with and you know who your uh, gatekeepers are and your roadblocks might be. So it's, it's important to really think through the full life cycle of what you're trying to achieve. I think it's so many projects don't take everyone on that journey and that's what really eats into your ROI. So even down to, you know, <clears throat> understanding the user base of what you're proposing. They might not be in your teams, but your services and your um, functions, you know, as I say, impact on many, many people in diverse aspects, either inside the organization or you know, things like airports or shopping centres, then, of course, you've got, you know, the public flowing through um, those environments as well. So I think it's it's really worthwhile in understanding, you know, the life cycle of change before you start to change, because then you can keep that finger on the pulse as you change. Because some people will embrace what you're trying to do easily, and some won't. That's just the, the nature of digital transformation. And there might be aspects of the skills or the competencies being able to adjust to the new operating digitally infused model. And if you haven't identified who they are, and again, this is where information models are really powerful because you start to understand not only what communities are going to be impacted, but also in what way. What's the information, you know, that they're going to start possibly having to deal with or certainly live with? And in what way can you then qualify that back to, you know, things that you can then measure and, and, and ultimately manage? So I think this is it's certainly the the stage after identifying that organizational needs but i think th this isn't just a, as i say about the operational function or the practice this is really useful to understand that that rhythm of the organization you know even as i said earlier on things like the culture the quite the quite subtle things but if if anyone's tried to do a transformational program across country borders, you know, things like culture are are not to be um, un underestimated. And 
if you can understand what your backbone to your program is and then what's the wrap around that your stakeholder communities need now we understand what we're doing and how we need to do it uh, and and we're we're in a we're in a really good position now to to forge forward with the rest of with whatever your project might be but again you've got a common language and you've got a common platform and how you're going to uh, ultimately embrace that change Gordon, if I can just come in at this point with a couple of questions from the audience, because I think they 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 they've been framed around the stakeholder piece, but actually I think particularly this one from Remco, they go slightly to to base principles. And Remco says um, for the really top level stakeholders, like CEOs, for example, executive boards, they don't know what they don't know. They don't necessarily know what they want from the change the system and so the starting point can be from a different place how how do you think that can be overcome uh, that's the beauty of an information model you can approach it from any angle and you know how it cascades and impacts on the rest of your corporate environment uh, but you're always telling the one story no matter what functions looking at it. So you can come, you know, and we'll see some of the case studies um, later on that re really tackle this. You know, s some people might be motivated by sustainability or customer experience or asset performance, uh, and that's all good. But the chances of you may have niche programs that tackle very, very... Um, small spectrum efficiencies and digital transformation but more often than not you'll be evolving multiple things at the same time so that's why if you if you can talk to each of the stakeholder groups in their language you've got a much better chance of reaching to that success and everyone getting there together thank you very much that 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 I'm going to let you run on, but that may lead us into a question that Lloyd's asked that I think we might get to, and maybe maybe it's a good one to think about as we're going through, because Lloyd's fully on board with bringing stakeholders along. That their, their role is 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 absolutely involved in in doing that. But how do you how do you, actually? There's a beautiful mixture of metaphors here. How do you how do you avoid boiling the ocean while you're eating the elephant? So um, I think that kind of goes to, you know, it's huge. Everyone can look at it from any direction, as you've just been saying. And and and, and, the, and the, the requirements piece is, is really actually just helping everybody to be looking at the one thing. And then I guess really maybe as you take us through, Gordon, how not to how, how to how to take like little bite sized pieces of the elephant of the elephant, perhaps. Sure. I mean, ultimately, and this is one of the, the hardest parts of this is looking to transform something but you're ultimately going to transform yourself and you're and the, the part of this is you know putting some iot sensors in a room it, it is is often you know what's thought of in these some of these transformational kind of aspects or leveraging bim or whatever it is but actually you become a new fm you, you, your services change your operating model changes so as part of this what what do you want your fm to be and what does that mean to your organization and there's no set answer to that but genuinely i think every one of us can render a lasting change in how our organization thinks of fm so part of this and this plays more into into your roadmap, but you should almost have a kind of continuous review of your actual scope. You know, what are you as a service function and what do you think you can become as part of the change? Uh, and, you know, I think the opportunity for, for FM to move into being considered by the organisation, you know, in that experience management context and this sustainable pioneer and things like that are certainly 
potentials for where the sector can, as I said earlier, reimagine itself too. If we pop to the next slide, we'll hopefully keep some questions flowing in. And I guess part of what I've seen over the last sort of decade or so is the, the digital transformation seem, seen as something in the future or something that you're going to work on. But we're all in it, whether we like it or not, today. Um, you know, things like the smartphone definitely got, you know, most of certainly the developed world onto a digital landscape. Uh, it might have been for playing solitaire and checking the news, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter what you use them for. The fact is you're on that landscape. So understanding, and this is something that's potentially skipped, um, but it's again, it's I don't think you can. Is you might be trying to get somewhere, but you need to know where you are. And in this space, we're really looking at um, breaking down, you know, those those uh, silos, breaking down those barriers. Again, we've gone through the other slides, and if you've gone through those processes and protocols, then when you come to understanding where you are it's all mapped into that and it's easy to, to live with and continuously understand. If not, then getting to some sort of understanding of where things are, and that can even be with your people. You know, often a project falls down, down to the user's digital skills and the way that they work with data or have been trained and supported to, to be in that space. So I think this is a, this is very much what the digital maturity framework that that was in that's in the uh, guidance document um, deals with. In inside that document, how we break the the landscape down to get a mapping is by the structure of the fundamental uh, management system of FM across a function set of the FM uh, capabilities. And then that way, in that um, exercise, we very deliberately kept away from the technology because the technology changes all the time and you really want a framework that doesn't change. Uh, maybe maybe when certain sub kind of whole life outcomes start to rise to the surface, like, you know, net zero or something like that, then maybe you need to elevate some of these particulars because it needs extra guidance. And that's that's fine. That's a lot of the time down to your organization information requirements and those corporate drivers. But really, you don't want fundamentally how you understand your landscape to, to be to be radically change, changed. Um, but I would also say with this is, this is one to live with, keep continuously updated as well. Um, when you do implement new technology, then this gets addressed and you kind of have a living documented ecosystem uh, model that you can, for any business case, um, very quickly and easily um, leverage. So this is really all about um, starting to <clears throat> deal with that elephant, deal with that large landscape Um Typically, it will be a mixture, as I say, of skills, of systems, of <clears throat> process and standards, legislation and requirements, and ultimately the the, the technology set itself. Uh, so, I think I think again, a lot of the challenges of what we're dealing with is not only is FM a broad church, but the amount of technology we can leverage to enhance our operating models is also <laughs> quite a long list. So not everything is the right thing for a given operation to digitize with. So it is really important to understand um, the opportunities and also the potential challenges within where you currently are before you you know you really start to move move beyond that. So if we 
nip to the next slide, we can see um, once you know where you are, then hopefully some of those challenges, some of those opportunities are uh, in front of you. Uh, and But as I said earlier on, it's highly unlikely you'll have either the budget or the capacity to transform everything. So this is when you're starting to build out on your on your roadmap and starting to put in these blocks of understanding. And I think for 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 me, um, operating with a kind of Kanban type board, no idea is a bad idea. You may never get to the far right hand side because I don't know, it's dealing with quantum mechanics and that's not in scope for, you know, the next few decades or whatever. But any idea can be on those boards, and then as they progress um, from right to left, ultimately you're starting to enact some of these projects and programs. Um, typical, typical process in in the digital world with things like software development. That these are, you know, these kind of agile methodologies of of operation and and how to manage those again. FM doesn't need to reinvent a lot of these wheels and for this type of evaluation and consideration some of those more digital operations we can learn a lot from um, some sectors are, are quite a bit further you know on in the journey than we are um, things like finance couldn't really operate without a global digital model uh, but even things like oil and gas which is maybe a little closer to us in terms of um, services are, are dealing with maybe slightly more challenging high cost and, and, and risk assets. So that's kind of forced forced the, the return possibilities and the maturing of these models into more digital um, enabled environments. So I don't think it's just about looking, you know, at our own selves and our peer group. I think there's some really good um, examples and inspirations that you can draw from, you know, the the, the broader world around us. Um, but again, it's sometimes it's quite difficult to not get enticed by what's getting the press and the possibilities of the technology. But for your actual operating model to get to your main prize you know don't don't be scared to take a step back to take st three steps forward i would say and and this kind of ability to start evaluating your options and as i say not necessarily closing ones out but just starting to consider what they could be and whether it's quarterly or half yearly you know trying to evaluate the next phase the next program separate the, the good ideas from the bad but again this is also a space where if you've already got a good strong stakeholder initiative running then sometimes the best ideas come from the people you're serving um, and even the people that, that are in your teams so uh, leaving the door open to some of those emerging ideas and you know emerging capabilities are will really help you to rationalise what's going to give you the best return on your initial digital transformation journey um, because there's 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 nothing that a CFO likes than back to back to back success from your projects and initiatives and uh, I, I think the, the FM digital transformation can be an organisational gravy train um, and if you don't get the first steps right then it, that's also the, the, the converse so you know, don't don't bite off more than you can chew, but look for the low hanging fruit, and uh, try and take things that you can demonstrate a robustness and return from what you do. Um, but always be looking at, you know, your your horizon point as well, because some some parts of your transformation will inevitably lay foundations for future transformation as well. Um, so getting the sequence, which will will unfold as, as we get into, through this, but into a really logical, uh, delineated roadmap that lets you make a good evaluation of your choices 
it is again the, the, the gift that really keeps on giving. So I, next, if we, if we pop forward. So we've we've talked about stakeholders and, and that's really relevant, but ultimately, and the, sometimes the stakeholders and the actual transformational defined roles could be the same personnel. That's entirely possible, but they could also be uh, different people. Um, typically through your operating model, you'll have a lot of um, this personnel that really help in meeting the digital change in the middle. So I think here we're really, again, it's this, this not only gives you the right people to support the transformational need, but communication is going to be key. And if you know the, who your, um, who your key roles are, then they are, they become an echo chamber of the tra transformational communications requirements. So you, you, again, a lot of the times in the change programs I've been involved in, it's not just about communication, it's talking the right language. Um, the <clears throat> It's so easy to lose people on this journey. I mean, the stats, not just in the UK, but the stats around the world are horrendous statistics. Um, I mean, we, we genuinely don't see any country who having, you know, over half of their projects reaching a return. And, and sometimes those stats are, are, are a bit worse than that. So the pitfalls are many, um, but certainly you're going to need your team. You're going to need your roles uh, to help not only get the right kind of change, but to support it. A lot of projects as well start to unravel if you don't have the right support structure around um, really supporting that change. It's hard. It's always hard change. So this shouldn't be underestimated. And if you have your defined roles that meet your stakeholder groups, you're just giving yourself every chance to talk the right language and support that transition, no matter what part um, of, the, of the need that that, that touches against. So, again, Gordon, sorry, Gordon, can I just come in on this? Yeah. Because this is this is the, defining the roles as an area that I think people on the last class found that they found challenging. But perhaps this is I, I wanted to put this to the broader panel, but I think it's it, it's and we can come back to it if we get a chance at the end. But I just wanted to put Reed's question to you here, which is that is in terms of defining the roles and building the teams to try and deliver this sort of transformation, what what kind of a challenge do you think there is about getting the right skills and resources into teams? Because a lot of people at the beginning said that resources were really difficult to come by to do this. People have also said they found this bit quite difficult of establishing roles and resp responsibilities. And we know that there's a skills problem in the sector. What do, what do you think, what about the challenge of, of, of attracting, attracting the right skills? actually two FM teams to undertake this transformation when when those type of skills are actually in demand elsewhere? Well, there's, there's obviously two parts to that. I mean, there's a skill shortage. Every sector's got it, um, particularly for these digital skills. So there's, I'm not, there's no way around that. That is a challenge. Um, we can't magic people up, um, for sure. I think one of the ways when you're competing for resources and, and ultimately interest is it's not just about money. Um, purpose can be quite a valuable tool. And I think FM has a hell of a purpose to say. It's sometimes how you how you tell it. So I think in that way, if you look at a job description and it's about, you know, an FM role versus it's actually about, you know, improving societal, environmental governance impacts, enhancing productivity, experience, performance, all of a sudden it's, you know, it's maybe got a bit more sizzle. So uh, 
still it's 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 a challenge because not enough people are out there. There just there aren't enough. So we're going to have that, but it's certainly no. Um, even in my own activities, there's if if it if it turns up the kind of excitement levels, then you you maybe you maybe stand a bit more of a chance in quite a competitive environment. Um, but yeah, on kind of on what was your other? There was two. <laughs> what was the other one? As well as the skills, I, I, I think you've, I think you've covered it actually by broadening it out. I think it was exactly that. It was about, you know, this is a challenging area as we've talked about, as and as our audience has told us, and we know that there's a challenge. And I think your, your, your actual, your thought about, you know, how you, how you broaden it out, and you know, fo and I, I know that we'll hear about this in the case study, is how you get to the thing, not the process it's almost the outcome and focusing things on the outcome is a is a an interesting but, way to frame it isn't it really I think well i mean there's the really getting at there's also a bit of you don't know what you don't know you know none of us do so i think it's well worth you know that is, this is kind of what this is all about this session today is to give some of those tools give some of those parameters but i appreciate it's nuanced depending on your operating model and your underlying demand organization. But you know, it's it at the beginning of a of a pro program and this is something I do myself in the day job, as it were, do work I mean, admittedly it's mostly Fortune five hundreds that are thinking in, in the kind of ways that, that that I'm dealing with, but we're you come in and I'll kind of look at almost that envisaging with a client. So sometimes it's, I think it's worthwhile getting in a third party to kind of think with you on what you can be, particularly if you've, you know, not got that structure and those tangible parts, um, you know, what, what is I, IOT? What is AI? What, I mean, ultimately, whether it's IoT, AI, BIM, who, who kind of cares? What's it going to make me? What's it going to do for me? What's the value it's, it's going to provide? Those are the, the, you know, you might be able to sprinkle in some of the tech just to, you know, help and help and tell the story. But most of the time, the C-suite wants to know what's in it for me is the bottom line. And AI doesn't tell me that. Whereas, you know, 40% reduction on first tier help and support okay now now that's talking a language i can kind of understand your business case against um so i'm conscious of the time so I, and, and and i do want to get to this because we've got i think experience is the best teacher and we've got two other um good strong gentlemen with us today for for telling some of that story but if we get into into I I did start to allude to it on the previous slide. Uh, communications key. Uh, it's just going to be everything else we've gone through up until now is making sure we have the right narrative, we have the right foundation, the right language, the right team, the right stakeholders, getting all the right things around you. But when you start to move, everything starts to change, and communications um going to be so critical. Um, you, a lopsided um, vehicle it just sucks out efficiencies. Um, you really want to even even if you know it's 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 annoying. You still need to almost move as fast as your slowest part uh, because the second you start fragmenting and losing parts of your organization or your operation, it it it's not worth it. Um, so the real way to do that is is to really put the people first in the process, um, really make them data foundation, data driven, but human centric. It has to be what what we're thinking, um, not not for some, you know, want to be seen as the nice guy, but just a return of investment. It's going to bring you a better return if people go with you on the journey and people appreciate. You've taken the time to make this, you know, 
talk their language and 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 then you as i say you're kind of evolving fm into you know a much more um, supported to function across the the entire organization requirements and i guess let some of that good good traditional fm um, value uh, get get liberated a bit more and let us um, drive more of that back um, in return so uh, i'm going to just go to the next one because i did handle a lot of this in the in the previous one um but we're we're as soon as you and uh, you know as soon as you stand something up there is a cost and this is a lot of the time what prohibits some of these processes and programs is uh, it's not a magic wand you've got a login and the job's done uh, you know the the statistics would say something like you know one and a half percent of your entire project cost will be in information management some depend on how your ecosystem set up that that cost could be higher to maintain your data um it's also understood that the returns that that data can kind of bring to your operating model are obviously in advance of that, those costs, but the costs come first. And we've seen earlier on about capacity, budget, and these points, and these are very real. Um, and if it isn't broken, do I try to fix it? Do I try to digitize it? You know, v valid points. But it's, I think, as we've started to see with more and more progression of strong technologies, um, the technical debt, which is a very real thing, that you start to carry um, will start to hit your uh, P&L and uh, your balance sheet and your operating budgets. So it, it, this is what this session's about, is trying to demystify it. Every FAM can bring about a digital change. I, I'm almost certain to say that on this um, session, but getting the right ones and then making sure your process is mature in the way you go about it, not mature digitally, you know everyone will be at different levels but the way you go about it would be the way you go about your fm have that compliance de-risk it all the things that as i say we've got to bring to bear for for digital transformation just because it's something a little different to maybe what we're used to doesn't mean we abandon those fm practices they govern over this type of process as well and as well as the conversation, um, it should be FM led, software supported, um, in, in my mind, and the, and then that way, I think in a lot of ways the the software vendors then have a far greater sector to work with, um, far easier for them to then meet us in the middle. Whereas a lot of the times at the moment, we're looking for almost FM from the software providers, and that that kind of then says, well, what's what's our purpose? So I think it's really important to understand how you're going to live with whatever technology you're going to bring in. You know, what data is it going to provide? Who has access to it? You know, how are you going to control that? And the way, even inside your organization, that your data can start to be leveraged by likes of HR, finance, and, all, and, and so on and so forth. You know, these are worth, again, putting some structure, putting some governance and guidance around, um, even even standards, again, like um, ISO 27001 provides a really strong framework for information security. So for all of this, I can assure you there's many sectors that have gone, you know, finance I mentioned earlier on, the, 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 the digital ownership in finance is way beyond the requirements of today's FM, so we don't need to reinvent these wheels. They've, they've, they're the ones that had to do it, get the scars, you know, take the hits as they matured the model over the years. We can just sweep that up and and add some of those practices to our wheelhouse. Um, but really, really important, um, particularly you know the the the, the latest software, um, kind of. I don't know if fads the the right term, but highlighted um capability probably is around these large language models like Baird, 
from Google and Chat GPT and various universities have been working on them and you know they're really powerful, powerful tools. But the data inside them, the models that they work from, people have, you know, as soon as these things became popular, started to kind of prod the edges of them. And they're not infallible. Um every time you log into these tools, they give you a you know, a little sign off to say we can't guarantee the results. Um but when you're reporting into your business, you want to be able to guarantee. So this is a really important um point. If we go to the next one, I'm gonna to need to speed up. Apologies, audience, I've been enjoying this too much. Um so then now we're really on the technologies themselves. And I I would say there's there is a lot. I've mentioned AI, what kind of AI, you know, machine learning, neural networks, these various kind of, you know, uh, image processing. AI can do many different things. Um, so understanding what it does and how that affects you is is really, really important. We've got IoT, we've got blockchain. There's so many technologies themselves that some of them work together even never mind what you know what what iot is on its own what iot with ai looks like what iot with blockchain and they you know they get you can get lost pretty quick there is a new iso standard um 41 iso 41016 which is due hopefully for publication quite soon which does try to tackle um this technological landscape with um its core kind of um, parts of technology and how they align to the operating model. Um, but I, people like Gartner, um, which the ISO framework also syncs with, um, also have good models. Um, but that is part of this is you don't need to change in one way, understanding what options you have, what type of technology, what type of data is it going to produce and what type of change is going to impact on your operating model are all really important things to to then pick the right type of tech in the right um, part of your process. If we go to the next one. So I think this is maybe the last or second last, but you've got to... These programs are a living thing. So if you can't measure, you can't manage. So how, once you've understood what you're going to do and the value it's going to bring, you need to know how you can tie that into measurement and how you can monitor your progress, but also communicate it. You know, as as people go on this journey with you, they're, they're going to want to understand impacts and, and the value from it. So it's very important to know. And again, data is great for measurement. Um, but what parts of the data, what frequency to what stakeholder groups and in what way are you going to be tracking what you would call value from from these programs? So we go to, I think, the last slide. So that all then comes to this culmination of a living forward path, a roadmap, a continuous improvement program. You're never going to stop digitally changing. The tech's not going to stop progressing, so this isn't get through our first year and then we're, we're we've made it across the finish line. This is a change in a way of being. This is a change to your actual native operating model, and this is really um, something you once you implement, it's going to become part of your common practice. So I apologise. I think I've overshot a little bit, um, but hopefully that's brought some of our aspects to life but you know really looking forward to hearing the case studies and and some questions if i've if i've allowed any time <laughs> well thank you so much gordon that was really thorough and um a, a really well balanced um presentation i think dan if we can go straight to you because dan you've actually been through this you've brought some of this to life and it'd be really brilliant to hear your journey so thank you so much Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dan Stevens, Senior FM at Adidas. Um, here to present two case studies today, um, two pieces of work completed by my team and myself this year. Um, but more importantly, to give you some examples of how that data and some of that technology has not just helped shape the design, but also 
um, help us realize, realize those benefits post-completion. In terms of my responsibilities, um, so I look after the UK. Uh, that does include Ireland. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough to have a nice blend of uh, property. So we have a headquarters based in Stockport that serves North Europe. That's where I'm, I'm sat today. A rather extensive retail portfolio, 34 stores uh, across the UK at the moment uh, due to grow uh, in 2024. Really positive considering um, the economic challenges that everybody's feeling at the moment. Uh, and also one distribution center that serves uh, North Europe. That equates to uh, 137,000 square feet and provides a working environment for over 1,900 employees. In terms of my day-to-day -day deliverables, hard and soft services, I think that's common across uh, FM, all capital projects uh, and anything that sits under CDM, uh, energy management and reporting, uh, so that includes SECR and ESOS. Uh, the UK fleet, couriers and post. Couriers is slightly different for me in that we're not responsible as such for uh, sending products out to consumers, the general public. We tend to deal with um, those that we sponsor as a business. So football clubs, football players, uh, anybody that has a direct sponsorship with Adidas. Uh, we've got some fitness facilities in the UK as well. That sits uh, sits with my team uh, and all, all forms of contract management. Next slide, please. So in terms of the two case studies that I wanted to go through today um, that have just finished, um, two different strategies, so top down and a bottom up. Uh, if we start with uh, solar PV first, uh, contract value, £578,000. Um, PV array was sized at, or it is sized at 647 kVA. So fairly substantial PV array. I don't have much time today, so I can't go into the finer details, but what I have done is pulled out some of the key points along those project timelines that get us to the, the most important stage and that that's the benefits realization. So every project at Adidas starts with the development of an RFP. So if we think about the, deci the, the decision framework that Gordon touched on um, and our business objectives, so our primary objective was to help contribute to that top-down strategy, so that, that global approach to achieving net zero. The second objective, and probably the most important from a cost perspective and also um, an energy saving perspective is having a design that allows us to use as much of what is generated as possible. Um, had some experiences in the past where um, companies that specialize in these kind of solutions are only interested in putting as many panels on your roofs as possible, which is great, but commercially um, that has an impact on your project costs your return of investment takes longer um, and ultimately you end up feeding far too much into the grid. Um, so as part of that RFP process, the, the one piece of data that we submitted to those that were invited to tender was a half hourly data. So that is fiscal information that comes from our main company electricity meters um, for the Stockport site, which is where the solution is based. How we achieve that, simply connecting um, our BMS system, building management system into our fiscal meters and also any sub meters that are located around site. Um, and being able to have sight of that data doesn't just contribute to the energy management reporting that I'm responsible for. What it ensures at RFP stage is that when potential partners are shaping those designs. They're working with data that's objective. They're not working with information that, for example, I've given them based on what I think is the right thing to do. So I did see a comment about de-risking projects. Um, <clears throat> and that's the kind of information that's helped de-risk this. But more importantly, 
plays a direct role into helping us achieve our business objectives. So there's some considerations as well that we need to submit at RFP stage, um, so roof details, BMS designs, technical drawings, um, anything else that was needed to ultimately get the ball rolling with um, the design. We then move on to the next stage, that's costs ultimately and system sign off. So there's some consultancy work that we need to complete around portal frames, just making sure that the design that we've received based on the data that we've provided at, at the beginning um, is suitable for the, for the roof that we need it um, installing on. Some work around LV acceptance, so that's connecting to the grid. And then the final piece, project costs and that, um, and the return on investment modeling, which when you look at it from a financial perspective is really important. As a rule of thumb, we look to have a return on investment with four years normally as a business with most projects. We then move on to stakeholders. So you will notice here that the, cut, the request for funding has come after the design. So I, I work with colleagues, particularly in Germany, that tend to approach the business for some money and then make the design suit the budget. I tend to work the other way around where we do the design first, make sure that it's, it's correct, it achieves those objectives set out in the RFP so that when I present to my internal stakeholders, I'm absolutely certain that what I'm asking for and what I'm committing to from a delivery perspective um, is ultimately going to be successful. And we end up with a project that's delivered on budget. So for this particular piece of work, three key stakeholders, um, VP for finance, who's based in Stockport with me, uh, head of sustainability in Germany, and also Manchester Airport. Um, so for those of you that are considering PV uh, for your organizations, if you are close to an airport, my recommendation is that you speak to them before you start work. We had to do a piece of work to look at glare factors on panels and the, imp the implications they would have um, based on certain aircraft flying at different heights around Manchester. And because there's no UK legislation to overrule what the airport say, whether yes or no, in terms of whether that project goes ahead or not, you are governed by what the airport states. So if I was to have sign off internally for the project from a funding perspective and Manchester Airport said, well, actually, Dan, not happy with that. The project's a complete non-starter. So um, that did cause us some delays. Um, ultimately, we, we were only made aware of the consultancy work that was needed when we applied for planning with the local council. So um, just as a bit of, bit of feedback there. Um, but ultimately the project was approved and then we get into the exciting stuff, which ultimately is delivery. So we then awarded the project. We then get into the legal frameworks. So we had a, a choice between a JCT or an MF1, which is more of an engineering contract. Um, we felt JCT was better. We then move into installation and BMS integration. Agreement feed-in tariffs. So what I've found with this piece of work is that feed-in tariffs in the UK aren't particularly great. Um, so just thinking back to the RFP development and the, that success criteria, by having a solution that allows us to use as much as, as we can, it means our feed-in tariffs or the rate in which we feed electricity in comes down, thus having a positive impact on that return on investment. We then had some work around BMS um, front-end development. So we've done a, a really nice piece, um, more of a, a visual representation of how the system's performing. That is up under the lights within our main communal areas within the business, just to give people on site an insight into you know, what we're spending our money on ultimately, because there are some people that 
albeit not involved with the sustainability side of things, are really passionate about you know, doing the right things for the environment. So um, really nice uh, piece of engagement work there. Once that work is then completed, what is absolutely paramount for us as a company is benefits realization, which I'll come, come on to once we've touched on, on HVAC. Second piece of work, um, which was delivered alongside uh, solar panels, was a HVAC upgrade. Um, very much a bottom-up strategy, so it was a, it's an operational issue. Contract value was £789,000, and it's taken just shy of 10 months to complete because it was, it needed to be delivered. During normal working hours, we've, we've been moving people around all year to accommodate team that have been installing the solution. Similar to PV, um, from a process perspective, so it always starts with the RFP development and what our business objectives are. So no real global objective to, um, to align with, with this piece of work. It was very much uh, an operational issue. So lots of complaints from staff about temperature, um, high failure rates, reactive costs were, were going up. Um, so it was very much something that we needed to, to action as a company because that workplace experience wasn't particularly great, more so in the winter months. Um, we then move on to design. So slightly different approach this time around with the system that we went for. Um, just thinking about technology, one of the requirements, mainly from myself, to be honest, was, was a solution that was more flexible. So it was very much a demand-based heating solution. Uh, we operate a uh, hybrid working policy as do most organizations. So we tend to see uh, fluctuations in occupancy rates between Monday and Friday. Friday tends to be, uh, acquire today. So from a, a functional perspective, we wanted we wanted a solution that was very much demand driven. That has an impact on cost, has an impact on sustainability. I don't think either of those topics out, outweighs each other. I think they should be treated exactly the same because they're both important. Some additional technology installed uh, as part of the um as part of the project. So um monitoring outside temperature to support that demand-based solution, measuring CO2, measuring VOCs. We're a sports brand ultimately, and if there's one thing that we're passionate about, it's creating working environments that allow people to perform at the best. So um, that ultimately shapes the scope and, and the design of the solution that, uh, that we went for. We then get into costs and development of the phasing program. Uh, as I mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago, it was a solution that we needed to deliver during normal working hours. So to keep a business like Adidas operational whilst delivering a project as intrusive as this was, um, has, has been a challenge. From an approval perspective, uh, just the one internal stakeholder uh, this time and, and that was the VP for, for finance. So um, similar approach to uh, the PV project from a, a business case perspective. Um, cost is, is ultimately the, the one piece of information that finance are interested in. But what was crucial for, for me when presenting that business case for investment was the supporting documentation that needed to come with it. So... We um, we have what's called a forward maintenance report for for all of our sites and FMR, um, which is effectively a life cycle. I'm sure there's there's people on the call today that are familiar with that. Um, <clears throat> we use a document called SIPSI Guide M for our condition ratings. So, albeit we know we have some issues that we need to address now. As Gordon alluded to around that communication piece, we knew three years ago through our forward maintenance report and our condition ratings that 
this project was something that we needed to start planning for financially. So this isn't a piece of work that has just landed on our desk without prior notice. We've been talking about this for, for two to three years, and I'm already talking about assets that need attention in 2026 and 2027. So it's a really useful document to start proactively communicating where we need to be investing. Staff complaints log, again, uh, touched on the workplace experience. It's a really, it's, it's a basic tool, but it's a very powerful one. It, it tells a story. Um, <clears throat> we had some work completed around U values uh, last year because we weren't sure whether the the HVAC system was the issue or whether it was the office leaking like a sieve. Um, so that, again, really useful piece of information that demonstrates to the business that we're doing everything we can from a due diligence perspective before ultimately coming to, to them to request a uh, budget to deliver these kind of, kind of projects. In terms of systems, we also operate a uh, CAFM system. Um, Mosaic is, is the platform that we use at the moment. Information that we would tend to pull from that for this kind of business case would be reactive data um, and ultimately spend. So bring all that information together, um, help shape a really strong business case. And again, ultimately, uh, we were successful with, with the business case that we put forward. On reflection, I would probably say it was successful because we were talking about it two or three years ago. And that's where that, those asset registers, the, that life cycle um, becomes critical because you are proactively preparing the business financially for these kind of investments. And if there's one thing I've learned in my career is that directors, chief execs don't like surprises. So a bit of proactiveness um, has, has normally served as well. We then get into the exciting stuff again, which is project award, uh, legal frameworks and, and installation, BMS integration, and then finally that client demonstration. That then brings us on to the benefits realization. Next slide, please. So um, I can't give you the full benefits realization for HVAC today because it's it only finished two or three weeks ago. However, what I can do is share with you the energy performance since PV was completed and HVAC was finished. Albeit we don't understand the full landscape yet with HVAC, we know that the demand-based solution with that kind of sensor technology um, is already having a direct impact on, on our energy. So thinking back to the RFP stage where we were looking at half hourly data to understand our usage profiles. Since these projects have been completed, we've then gone back into our main incoming electricity meters. And it's that ability to be able to interrogate those meters that are able to provide us with information that I would say is objective. So this piece of information relates to we commenced on the 5th to the 11th of June, um, and we were tracking at 76% 70%, saving versus the same period last year. It will fluctuate because external looks levels change throughout the year, but that is modelled into our financial plan. So it's expected. But what this does demonstrate is that by using the data that you have, at the beginning to de-risk your project and effectively give you biggest bang for your buck. You're then able to come out of that process and then be able to go back to the business with objective data again that demonstrates that what you ultimately asked for from a funding perspective at the beginning and the savings that you that we committed to have been delivered um so yeah as i say i think um from our side this year with these two pieces of work 
it's the technology and that data and they're not industry leading solutions i think most companies would have bms everybody has access to electricity meters um but it played a, a substantial role in ensuring that you know the, the work that we've delivered this year 1.3 1.4 million pounds worth of work has been delivered on budget and it's been delivered on time and it's delivered the savings that uh, we committed to to the business and that's it thank you Dan thank you so much for that that was really fascinating and um you know just the, the, how you've applied the principles that we've been talking about in a in a context that's really done well not only really good things for the environment but really good things for your business is 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 really really fascinating um i'm really conscious of time that we're just running over time a bit we've still got a really good number of people on the on the on the session so i'm hoping that alex we can sneak you in um for you to take us through and then if if, if people have got five or ten minutes we can do some questions because we've still got a really really good number on so if people can hold on that would be fab over to you yeah um, thanks jenny I, I won't take too long I'm, I'm aware of time as well but it's a real success story the, our, our journey with the university of sunderland there's a case study on our website i um I really encourage people to go and read but it was the quickest return uh, on going live that we've had with the customer simply because the digital transformation steps that gordon alluded to the six-step process a lot of them without them really knowing they they took part in that process you know, they started with a clear vision of what they wanted before coming to market. They were ready and they had stakeholder engagement and alignment. We did a really deep um, pre-sales engagement with them to actually really understand what they wanted and their prior stakeholder engagement to use that software prior uh, and make decisions based off that RFP process uh, and select the right vendor ultimately for them. And just taking a minute or two to to talk about the developer roadmap side of things and i really really agree with gordon that developing a roadmap is both an operational roadmap and a strategic roadmap is an ongoing evolution it never stops um so they came to us to university of Sunderland came to us to um have a clear vision of their estate um to be able to report and and uh make processes more efficient and, and building on that foundation, which we've done now, we're now looking at the more digital transformation pieces as we'd see it from a modern perspective of, of IoT digital twins, of connecting an ecosystem, um, making a move from reactive and traditional PPM based maintenance to conditions based maintenance, connecting up BMS systems, for example. And they did that from a foundation um, through organizational change. So. Um, conscious of time, I uh, would have loved to have spent uh, a bit more time talking about it. I'm happy to speak about it um, more and more. But uh, yeah, it's a really good success story. John Knight and the team there are, are open, as the um, people from the Northeast generally are, of talking about their experiences. And I really encourage you to reach out to, to me or anyone at Plan On and, and to John directly itself to talk you through how they went through that digital transformation piece in relation to an IWMS. Thank you so much, um, Alex. And I'm sorry we squeezed you a little bit on time there. Absolutely. I, I mean, the, the case study is fascinating. I think it's absolutely well worth anybody reading it. And we'll try to link across to it in the in the webinar um, info uh, that we send out with the masterclass, just so people can have a look at that because it's well worth going through. And in in a sense, actually, again, if we've just got a little bit of time to to to, to focus on some questions, Gordon's been been industriously answering yeah. some of the questions that came up in the chat. But I just did wanted to bring to the fore a question that Reed Cunningham had posted because I think it's quite relevant both to what. Well, to, to some of the stats that that, that, that Gordon posted, because Gordon had some quite impressive ROI stats um, and, and, and one, one person in the chat asked where they'd come from and Gordon's answered that and said they're from a variety of sources. But read, you know, Dan talked again about some really good benefits realisation for, for him and, and, and the crew at Adidas. And I just also wanted to just maybe ask all of you really about this question that Reed has asked, which is, are there unrealistic expectations ever on quick wins from digital initiatives? And, and, and he also maybe just asked the question about the difference between data, so, you know, information gathering data, information that you can act on, and then knowledge that, that you actually really get 
into your business or into your objective from that. So just just a comment from you, maybe all really on on is this all a bit unrealistic or are the ROI figures you're showing, you know, absolutely bang on and genuine for the for the sector. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one when I read that because it, it may not be unrealistic expectations, but it might be unrealistic timing from most organizations as to how quickly they're going to achieve these things. And for us, many of our conversations of, across multi-sectors is um, start small. <laughs> um, a lot of people try and chew the elephant all at once, uh, which was a question related earlier. Um, but that digital expectation and quick wins is realistic within this sector. Um, FM plays a pivotal role in achieving that um but it is it is realistic it's just i think that we have to be um conscious of time and conscious of starting point one of the points i was going to touch on with the university of sunderland is their data and their people were ready for that change prior to starting the project um as dan mentioned in his his, it was a thorough rfp process and and that also meant change management process prior to that transformational beginning um so yeah i I think it it is realistic but it it has to be set from the top (laughs) thank you alex i think i think those are really um important points there aren't they and you know it's as you say it might not be that the objectives are unrealistic in the first place it may actually be that you haven't really got you know your time or one of your other factors isn't 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 quite um realistic i'm just i'm just busy looking across in the chat here actually and i'm it, it's brilliant that some of our panelists are answering questions from people who have you know raised stuff and i noticed that again on roi dan your figures were being uh you know looking really impressed on the project that you did um and um that you you know you had it looks like you set the groundwork really well so some of the other fabric works you didn't need to do because your um your U your U values report on the status of your fabric integrity was was really really good to start with. So again, you had some really good baselining data there. You started off. It sounded like you applied the principles um, as you worked through um, to your to your project. Um, one of the things that really struck me when I was looking at the, both the case study actually for Sunderland, Alex, and also the work that you did, Dan, and again actually your six steps. Um, Gordon is that a lot of this is actually around soft skills as well as some of the real solid hard skills isn't it there's a lot of engagement coming through there's a lot of the need to communicate keep stakeholders on board and 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 clarity Um, and that surprised me actually I thought some of those principles around the soft skills that you need as well as obviously the really clear hard and technical and and, and numerical and data skills. Who, who'd like to comment on that? Because that, that that was quite surprising to me how much of that was relevant. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, certainly from, from a vendor perspective, the key success criteria is always the people. The technology is very good. It's very consistent and it allows you to do a multitude of things very successfully. But if there's no stakeholder engagement and soft skills to get that buy-in from your organization, it's never going to be a success. Um, so, yes, yeah, selecting the right vendor is key and selecting the right technology at the right time for your organization is key. But ultimately, if, uh, if the people aren't there to, to manage or that process of change isn't implemented correctly, the, the success factor and the success criteria is, is, is less likely to be realized. Yeah, I, 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 I think I, I mean we, we heard that at the beginning, didn't we? When people thought that they had challenges in certain area, it kind of came through. You've all talked about it and all talked about the importance of it. And then, as you're saying, Alex, it's it's both things, isn't it? We've definitely got this very real skills issue and this very real. And I loved what Gordon was saying, and I was also super impressed with the ROI numbers that you quoted on your slides, Gordon, and again, Dan, in terms of in terms of what you achieved and in the Sunderland case study as well, I think you see not only the pace at which that was operational, that was quite startling, wasn't it? And then the speed at which the people, Alex, in your example, saw the results. You know, I think there was one one quote where the team couldn't quite believe it was working because they'd they'd had this four clicks to a, a resolution of their problem and the, the, the team that were managing it through were kind of, you know, pressing the buttons thinking something must have gone wrong here. And in yeah. fact, it was actually that it was working really yeah. well. I'm sure so, many, you know, many help desks will know Know that uh, that's probably the biggest frustration is time taken to, to to create that ticket. But um on the skills gap and, and and allowing people to do other things, if if technology is allowing you to be more efficient, that means we have more chance to to upskill and look at other side of things. And for, for us, one of the big collaboration pieces from any organization is the FM system is and the FM team is generally at the heart of it, but it creates 
it, you must have cross collaboration with the likes of IT for skills that are required for digital transformation for any software. So again, that's a change management process internally as well to, to cross collaborate between departments to, to make sure that you have the right skills within that organization, because most of the time they are there. Yes, there's a lot of people that are very busy and they, they can't do it, but most of the time we'll be able to find somebody. Yes, and I think it's I, I, I think it's actually about some of this for me is about the opportunity that comes through the profession. Gordon, you were alluding to this all the way through here. And I, I, I mean, people are dropping off the call very slowly. So I think it's a real a real compliment to the conversation we've got going here that people are are peeling away slower than, uh, you know, gladly slowly because we've run over time. So, so so much but I just maybe just wanted to, to almost round off really I suppose with one question to you all which is to if you could kind of think about your your think back to your um less mature digital selves um starting off on this journey what what one piece of advice starting out on it would you really hold on to or would you you know would you do differently either either do again or do differently if you had your time again. Can I can I start with you, Dan? Because you're very recently through this on two massive projects. Yeah, it's a great question as well, actually. Um, what would I do differently? Mm. I think the communication ultimately is the is the most important piece. I think about stakeholder management. Um, you know, there, there was a phrase used earlier by Gordon that you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, and what I've also learned over over the last three or four years is that if you don't know what you don't know, go and find somebody who does know. So uh, what I mean by that is if I was to look at um, what I do now, so I, I, I'll stick with energy management um, for this answer, ESOS, SE, SECR reporting, those kind of um, formal documents that we have to do uh, as an organization, I, I generally, I, I don't know where to start with that kind of information or, or what I need to publish. So what I have done is onboarded a strategic partner that can help me do it. So... In the early stages, I was very much of the opinion that I needed to know everything, but that isn't actually the case. I think there's a lot of expertise out there um, already. I think it, sometimes it, it it's actually more beneficial to to go outside of the four walls of your organisation and and speak to people. Um, Sig Group's been a great start for myself, um, but yeah, try not to put too much pressure on on yourself in in assuming that you need to know it all because you really don't uh, and and lean on those external partners as well. I've learned so much from just having those kind of, um, let's say strategic partnerships around me um, rather than sitting, sitting on Google or, or whatever reading books and till the early hours of the morning, trying to get up to speed with things. So that, that would probably be, my answer. Apologies if it if it went off on a tangent a little bit, but it, it, I do you know what I think that's so such an honest answer down there, and I think we all sometimes do that, don't we? We think that we we've had boiling the ocean and eating the elephant actually quite a bit this afternoon, but I think you know we all think that sometimes we need to do it ourselves and finding mm. networks and collaborations that you can lean into, and a lovely shout out there from you for the tech sig. Um, as a source of inspo and um, you know learned support I think is really powerful and a really honest answer so thank you for that um, well, Alex what about you what would you what would you say to your other younger digital well not necessarily younger but your digital immature self if you met them again yeah I think I completely agree with Dan is um, and the theme of you don't know what you don't know and you, you can't know it all and there's going to be industry experts out there working in partnership that can help you on this digital maturity journey so yeah i, I completely agree what dan was saying there um you know seeking seeking help seeking the frameworks to use this to and and, and using them uh, as a guide for many organizations that we work with it would have sped up this digital transformation process um so it's a key area that uh, that, that should be a focus um, if I was ever going to do this uh, again, I would uh, seek help. 
Yeah, thanks. And it, it, it again, it comes back around to where we came in today, doesn't it? So real, really, really good reinforcement there of, of, of Dan's experience as well as your your own separate experience, Alex. And Gordon, I had a little bet with myself about you, what you might come up with as the one thing that you think you might do differently or you'd recommend to others. So let's just see whether you say what I think you're going to say um, as okay. to your one big learning. Trust yourself. I think um, a lot of the time, because of this digital landscape may not be familiar and might change your model, people kind of maybe get lost on that journey and the, the true value of FM kind of gets a bit blurry inside what change occurs. But I really think, and Alex hinted on it, the 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 technology is a, a tool to help you get to more of your FM value. So keep your FM value, trust yourself. You know what FM good looks like. You just need to learn some new tools to help you in, in that in that journey. But the, the other important thing, and I'll close on this, is own your information. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's not your data necessarily. You can work with partners on the data, but own your information. And that comes to your information model and how you ultimately map the value to you. That's a really good, a really, really good point to end on. And, th you know, three really solid points from all of you um, on that. Um, and I think it's, we've gone over by 15 minutes and more. So I think we probably should, we've got some really, you know, a really good number of people left on the call, but I think we should respect everybody's um, wish to get on with their afternoons and um, probably just um, wrap up um, the session for today. Um, I, I We've covered a lot, haven't we? Um, there's a lot of content there and we've got a recording of the session today for anybody who wants to go back to that as well as um, a recording of last week's um, webinar. And there Kai has got on the screen the guidance, which has been our North Star for a lot of the content, both in the last week's webinar and in today's session. So there's your QR code, download that guidance, um, you know, read it at your leisure. There's, there's, there's lots of real brilliant advocacy, not only for the profession in there, but some really, really solid guidance, practical steps on how to, how to get through and into some of this stuff. Um, thank you today to our excellent, excellent panel, Dan, uh, Dan, Gordon and Alex, not only for the time that you've given today, the extra time you've given us, we've gone into extra time and your quality insights. Thank you so much for that. Um, and um, if you can't find the, you know, download the guidance today. Um, thank you for joining us. Sorry we overran, but hopefully we've given you some food for thought. Thank you all for your questions and your comments and um, to our panel for answering them while we were going through. And of course, to Lucy and Kaya, our technical support who have been taking us through and holding us, holding us together today. Um, all of our other material, the professional standards that Gordon's alluded to, the guidance, it's all on our website. The tech SIG, which has had some lovely shout outs today, is always active doing lots of activity. So look out on our website um, or if you remember the emails about what they're getting up to. Um, and um, if you like what we did in today's session, perhaps apart from overrunning, tell us what you liked. If you think we could do th something differently, then tell us what we could do differently. Always willing to hear from you on that score. Um, I did have a couple of very quick notes. The uh, 30 years report that we put out yesterday is available again for download on the QR code or you'll find it on our website. And Gordon, you're featuring in there talking about OIRs and other the really really important things that organizations need to do and i think the real beauty of this report is 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 the potential that the sector and the profession's got to make massive changes we heard it from dan and um, we heard it from alex through the project with sunderland so really really important stuff to go there um thank you all so much we'll be back soon with our regular webinars program on wednesdays and activity that our communities are putting out as well in the meantime, we've got 100 webinar episodes to keep you busy um, if you need any bedtime reading or listening. So go for them. You can find them on playback on our website. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you to all of you again, our lovely panel, and uh, see you next time. Have a good day. Cheers, bye bye. Bye-bye.